All right, week three, let's go. So let's go ahead and screen share, get everything ready. So we're going to start talking about the production decisions, right? So before this, we started talking about consumer behavior. What kind of bundle of goods would you like? About how much could you afford? Now we're gonna start getting into the production side of things, right? How much can we produce? How much is it going to cost us? So I think that this is kind of a fun section. I'm gonna to try to make the video shorter. I haven't quite found the sweet spot in between 30 minute videos or an hour long video. I know some students even prefer some that are 15 minutes. So I'm gonna to try to break it up a little bit more in this one. So first we're gonna go through production analysis, how we're going to start talking about the marginal product, the average product and the total product being produced by a company. Marginal product is the idea of if we add one more input, how does it change the output? Uh, average product is when we divide over a number of inputs, what the average that's being produced in total is just the total amount coming out. That sounds easy, but unfortunately, it's very nuanced and there's lots of pieces with it that we're going to have to consider. The next thing that we need to think about is cost analysis, right? So what's the marginal cost for producing one more of something or hiring one more worker or doing something else? What's the average cost for producing a good or service? Uh, what's the total cost? And we're thinking about our outputs and how much we can sell them for. What does that look like compared to the cost of our inputs? Then we have to think about optimal procurement. How much does it make sense to raise? After that, we'll talk a little bit about tariffs. Um, I, I don't think that one will be its own separate video. It's kind of a smaller topic, so we can probably wrap it into one before then. Now, this is going to start to pick up the pace. We're going to start going a little bit faster. You're learning a lot of economics in a few weeks. Um, don't panic. We got this, we're gonna get through it. We're gonna get through it step-by-step step and start working through all these pieces. I know that this is a very difficult topic, but together we're gonna make it through, okay? So first let's start off with the idea of production analysis. So for everything that we produce, we're going to boil it down to two main ingredients, right? So we're gonna say that we can produce any good or service with some input of capital. So capital are the machines and it's it's the, the physical inputs that are going in and labor, the workers that we have working uh, to build a particular good or service, right? And we're going to say that each amount of output is some combination or can be made by some combination of capital and labor inputs. So most of the time when we start to write it out, we start thinking about a production function. Notice that I have a couple pieces pieces of documentation here, right? So we have Q, um, that's going to be a notation that represents what is being produced, right? So the amount being produced. Then we see that that production, the amount that's being produced is some function. I don't know if you remember back to calculus, but don't worry, we, we will get you back through calculus over the next week. But F represents sort of a function saying that there's some equation of the inputs that we need to be able to produce that amount Q. So this, in this function, we see that we have two pieces inside the function that's going to be in our equation. The first one is K, K represents capital. The reason we don't use C is just because we have so many other things uh, in, in statistics and economics that are used by C, such as like constants when you're doing integrating or derivatives. So one really great place to start with capital is just by calling it K because it helps with so much of that confusion. Next is going to be L. So these are units of labor. Depending on the question, units of labor can change, right? It can be an additional worker. It can be an additional hour work. It can be some other way that we are going to measure our labor input. So every Thing that we produce that function q is is a function of the capital and labor inputs now these are going to be very different depending on if we're thinking about the short run or long run decisions and that kind of makes sense let's think about if you are you have a business right let's say i have a mug right here let's say that i create mugs um i'm just it's so great i have some laborers uh we have we have a little pottery wheel to be able to make these mugs well what can we change in the short run? If all of a sudden my ceramic mugs become very, very popular, well, in the short run, I can hire an extra worker. I can ask one of my laborers to stay late. Or if the business is just doing terrible, I can send someone home early or I can tell someone like, hey, you know, don't come in this week. That we can adjust labor very easily in the short run, but we can't necessarily adjust capital in the short run. So as we're going through, remember that we're going to have the short run versus long run decision making. In the short run, the amount of capital is fixed. That means the number of pottery wheels that I have in my studio is going to be the number of pottery wheels that I have in my studio. I can do nothing about that in the short run. In the long run, 
I can buy a bigger pottery studio. I can have more kilns. I can have more pottery wheels to be able to make these beautiful ceramic mugs. In the long run, we can adjust the amount of capital, the amount of machines or non-human inputs that we're putting into producing something. Well, in the short run, we can't necessarily do that. We also have two other things we need to think about, which are fixed and variable inputs. So notice when I said we can't change capital in the short run, it's just not viable to be able to do that. So we say that this is fixed in the short run. We have a fixed amount of kilns. We have a fixed amount of pottery wheels. A variable means that it is something that we can adjust, such as um, let's say that pottery is doing really great this week. I want someone to stay later, or I want to add a couple extra hours for my employees. That's something that's variable in the short run. In the short run in this class, we're going to assume that capital is fixed in the short run and that labor is variable in the short run. Those, that's just gonna be a really nice decisive way for us to be able to work through everything without getting confused about differences and nuances in between short and long runs. In the long run, everything is variable. That's a very important thing to remember because I know lots of times students like to look at the exam, they like to see capital, and they like to think that it is always fixed. That's not necessarily the case, right? If you have years to plan, if you have years to figure out the scope of your business, you can change everything. You can change your location, you can change the number of machines that you own, you can change the the all the different pieces of capital that go into building your good or service. So in the long run, everything is variable because everything can be changed. So we're mostly going to fun focus on Cobb Douglas functions. Notice that we have this Q right here that I talked about, some equation to figure out what this Q of production is. That equation is typically called F, or I'm just gonna say that it's some sort of function. Now, function just means that there's an equation that's going to use capital and labor. Those are my two inputs. The easiest equation we have is called a Cobb-Douglas function. So here, actually, let me just draw this out. A Cobb-Douglas function is going to be where we have some amount of production, Q, which is equal to uh, well, first, let's just have it right here. So we're going to have our function of capital and labor so we can remember what this looks like. But let's say that we want to replace F with an equation. Well, a Cobb-Douglas um, deals with the fact that we are going to sort of equally have their exponents add up to one. The reason why we do this is it makes the math a lot easier on your end because you're taking an econ class, not a math class. So let's say that this production equals some sort of function where we have some amount of capital raised to an exponent, we'll call that exponent alpha, okay? And we're going to multiply that K to the alpha by some amount of labor to one minus alpha. Alpha, if some number is less than one, alpha less than one, but let's say it's greater than zero. We know that if alpha is some number in between zero and one, that this equation will come out to be nice and clean where we have some amount of capital, some amount of labor, and then that's going to come together to develop production. Now, how much utility or how much production we get from those capital or labor inputs are going to be determined by these exponents. So let's work through a couple examples. Sorry, I have the hiccups today. So when we go back to our production function, I give you an example here where I just have them equal to 0.5 for both. And then we start talking about what happens in the short run and what happens in the long run. Instead of just having or walking us through this, let me instead do this on the one note. So let's say that we are just having an equal amount of capital and labor inputs or an equal amount of the production process can be utilized by capital or labor when they're in equal amounts. Essentially, their alpha is equal to 0.5. So let's say that we have Q equals capital to the 0.5 times L to the one minus 0.5, which is also 0.5 in and of itself. Well, you should probably remember that anything raised to the 0.5 or, or to you know one half, uh, that's going to be the square root of a number. So it's just a very easy way to do it of thinking about the square root. So let's say that this is the short run. So let's start with this short run situation. And in the short run, when we're trying to figure out how much we're going to produce, let's say that capital is fixed because capital seem, is, is typically fixed in the short run, right? So let's say we have 16 units of capital. This cannot change. We cannot change this number to the 0.5. Then we're going to have 
some amount of labor. This can be variable in the short run because I can have my workers work longer or I can hire more workers also to the 0.5. Well, if I wanted to ask you questions right here, I could ask you how much are we going to produce? Well, first, let's simplify out this equation. Let's figure out, okay, well, what's the simplest way that we can think about it before we start plugging in numbers for L? Well, 16 to the 0.5, that's just taking the square root of 16, right? So our amount that we're going to produce is going to be equal to four, since four is the square root of 16, times L to the one half. Alrighty, so 4L to the 1 half, that seems easy enough, we can do that. So let's say in the short run, what would happen if, what would happen if we had 100 units of labor? All right, that's a good question. What would happen if we have 100 units of labor? This can be having 100 workers or this can be having 10 workers working 10 hours each. But let's say that it's 100 units of labor. So our quantity would be equal to four times, we'd plug in 100 for L since we saw that it was a unit of labor to the one half, which is just the square root of 100. We know the square root of 100 is 10, right? So this is actually going to be four times 10. Well, four times 10 means that our Q is 40. Nice. That just means the amount that we are producing in the short run when we have a fixed amount of capital at 16 and labor, um, uh, we have 100 units of labor that this, this equals Q. Now let's say that we want to massively scale up. We want to massively scale up the amount of people that we have working or how we're going to be thinking about some of these things. Uh, what's, what's a good example to do this? Actually, I think I know, I got it, all right. so. Let's say that, so this is situation one for a short run. Let's see what happens when we vary this amount of labor because there's something very important I'm about to want you to see. So let's have situation two right here. Let's think about what would happen if we vary that amount of labor or if we wanted to try to increase production because the goal really is to try to increase what that Q is. We would like to be able to produce more. So let's say that instead we're going to have 625 um, units of labor, right? So Q equals some function of K and L. We know that our function is gonna be Cobb-Douglas. So we have Q equals, and we're going to have our fixed amount of capital at 16 to the one half. And then we're going to have L. So let's say in this one, L equals 625. So we have massively increased the number of L, right? This is 6.5 times as much. So let's see if we get 6.5 times as much product when we have massively increased that number of, of workers. All right, so if we have 625 to the one half, what we get here is a Q that's equal to four times 25, which is just equal to 100. So notice what happens here. We have 2.5 times as much of Q, as much of Q, but we have 6.5 times as much L, that labor input. Notice that that means that we're getting a decreasing return to labor. For each additional worker we get, we're not getting the same amount that's in. Let's give you another situation. Let's actually make this much, much larger. So let's say we have a situation three. Let's scale this up even more when we're thinking about our production function between capital and labor, we're going to have a fixed amount of labor for Cobb-Douglas production function. So our quantity, our product is going to be equal to that fixed amount of capital. So 16 to the one half times, let's, what's a good one? Um, let's do 50 squared. So let's say that we're going to have 2,500, right? Like we are really adding them up here. We, we have massively increased the amount of labor that we have. Okay, so uh, we've gone from 100 labor. We now have 2,500 labor. So let's see, we have 25 times as much labor for L. Let's see if this gives us 25 times as much output or things that we are producing by Q. Well, if we do this, we multiply it to the one half, what is this? Q equals four times 50. 
uh, Q equals 200. Okay, so what do we see here? In this one, we have Q type equals 200. Here we have Q equals 400. Here we have Q equals 100 up here. So if we start out with our 100 units of labor, we multiply that by 6.5. We have only managed to get two and a half times as much output. Let's say that we instead want to multiply this um, 100 units of labor by 25. We hire 25 times as many workers as normal. We still only get four times as much output. Now let's think about why that would be, because this is part of the very uh, minute piece that I need you to understand when we start talking about increasing labor when we have a fixed amount of capital. It's the fact that when one of your inputs is fixed, it's you get diminishing marginal returns to increases in the other one, right? We increase the amount of labor. Well, that's not going to matter if we can't also increase the amount of capital. Let me give you a hypothetical. Let's say that we are working at a donut shop. Right, donut shops are great. Uh, I haven't had donuts in a long time, but I would really like some. They're they're wonderful. But let's say that there's a donut shop. Okay, well, if we have people working in a donut shop, let's say that we have one worker. Well, when that first worker comes in, they're having to do a lot, right? They're having to run the registers, they're having to answer the phones, they're having to make the donuts, they're having to do everything else. It becomes kind of hectic or crazy for them. So adding in a second worker might initially help them a lot. We haven't changed the number of ovens. We haven't changed the number of, of registers. We haven't changed the, the size of the building. But having two workers in there might initially help. Now you have someone who can make the donuts while another person ends up selling them or another person ends up working with them, right? Or working with the customers. All right, well, now let's say that we, we still have the same size donut shop. We still have one oven for our baked donuts or or one deep fryer for areas where we are deep frying dough. I don't actually know how to make donuts, but we're going to pretend like I do. We only have one set of machines, but we really want to be able to service more customers. So let's say that we hired 10 employees. Well, it doesn't matter if we have 10 employees, if only one of them can use the register at the time, or only one of them can use the oven or fryer at a time. If we do not increase the amount of capital or the size of the building or the number of machines we have, we can't just keep hiring more and more workers. If all of a sudden we have 10 workers or 12 workers or 15 workers, then we have a very, very full building where each additional person that I'm shoving in there isn't helping to make all that more donuts, right? So if we have one unit fixed, there's going to be decreasing returns that we get from increasing one type of, of input, whether it be the capital or the labor. In our case, it's the labor idea. If, if capital, the number of machines we have is fixed, then it's very difficult to do. I'll show you some graphs about what that means in a minute, but let's keep talking through sort of this, this example of it, right? And if you go to the slide, I just have replicated what we've already written down with the first example of what if we had 100 units of labor, but then I showed you it with 625 or with 2,500. What we need to think about as we're adding in more and more workers to our store is what is their marginal product? What is the additional amount of output that will happen for each extra amount of input? For each additional person I have working, how many additional donuts are, are, are fed out, right? Are, are able to be produced? That would be the idea of the marginal product of labor. How much additional product comes from one more worker? So this we tend to have with an equation. And actually, let me just show you what a good graph of this would be because we're gonna get to the graphs later, but you may as well now just to be able to understand what's going on. So let's say that we're talking about this marginal product of labor. Okay, well, our marginal product of labor, so we call this MPL, marginal product of labor. This is just going to be equal to, oops, the change, uh, where is the backspace? This is going to be the change in the amount of product. Remember that that product is Q. You, I notice you're seeing a Q here. We're not talking about quantity demand. We're not talking about quantity supply. We're talking about product when we're looking at Q. So the change in the amount of product that we are producing over the change in the amount of our labor inputs, so maybe the amount of hours that our people are working. If we have one more hour where our store is open, what's the additional product? If we hire one more worker, what's the additional product that is made from this, right? So that's called the marginal product of labor. I 
I kind of like to think about this in a graph just because it kind of helps me to understand what's going on. So let's say we have the amount of product Q and then let's have maybe the number of workers along here at the bottom, number of workers. We notice that for the marginal product of labor, it always tends to look a little bit like the same thing. So let's let's say that we have one worker or we can have two workers or we can have three workers or four workers or five workers. That's a pretty good number. So let's say when we have this first worker. All right. Well, we can finally open up the donut store, the donut store of our dreams. It's great. So when we have this first worker, they're a little busy. They're a little busy. Right. So maybe it's that they have to run the register and they have to make the donuts and they have to run the fryer. So oh, why? one's so sensitive. So let's say maybe they can produce, let's say 30 donuts when we have that first worker. That's the marginal product, the additional amount of output that we have for that first worker. Now let's say the second worker comes in. Oh, that's great. We finally have some help on deck. We're pretty happy about it. So the second worker comes in. Okay, well, now we have one person who's in the very front of the store, one person working with customers. We have one person in the back of the store who's making donuts. Maybe the extra amount of donuts that that donut shop is uh, producing has gone up. Maybe instead of the 30 donuts they had with one worker, they now are producing 70 donuts with two workers. Well, what's that change? Well, that means when we hired the second worker, our change in the amount of product would have been 40. If we went from 30 donuts to 70 donuts, we now have 40 additional donuts that are, that are being created because we have this third worker or second worker. Maybe we get a third worker. Well, we still have only one register and we still have only one one deep fryer. So if we have a third worker like, yeah, OK, we're getting a little extra done because they're there, but we're still limited by the number of machines we have. Right. So maybe we only get for them an additional, let's say, 20 donuts. And then maybe we get 10 donuts for the next person and five donuts for the next person. Ten, five. Your marginal product of labor curves tends to look something like this, where for our first couple workers, we might be increasing the marginal product of labor. The donut shop might be producing more and more for each person we put in because we're finally able to like have everybody do their own job roles. But then after that, things start to fall um, in the marginal product of labor. The extra amount that we can produce for each worker that, that we hire, it starts to go down. And that's the idea of we might be limited by capital. If we only have a certain amount of machines, then the extra, the fourth worker doesn't really give us all that many extra donuts being produced, or the fifth worker doesn't give us all that many extra donuts being produced. We call this, or graphs that look like this, oops, marginal product graph. All right. So we have this for labor. We also have this for capital. So if we do it the other way, let's say we have the marginal product of capital, MPK, because remember capital is represented by K. In this case, we're looking at the change in the amount of quantity. So the amount of quantity we have for a change in capital. If we add one more oven, how many extra donuts can we produce? Uh, or if we have one more deep fryer, how many extra donuts can we produce? If we have two registers, how many extra donuts can we get into people's hands, right? So this is the marginal product of capital. Wonderful. Um, similar thing, so I'm not going to draw it out again because both of these, uh, the marginal product graphs for whether it's labor or whether it's capital, they look the same. It's just the only part that's going to be different is instead we have the amount of product and then here we would have the number of, let's say, capital. So this can be the number of, let's say, deep fryers. If we had one deep fryer or two deep fryers or three, four, five, as we are going up, we will start from zero because when you have zero deep fryers, you cannot make anything with a deep fryer till one, which is great. We might even get more productive if we have two or three, but eventually that marginal product that's going to tail off, right? Because if we have five or six um, deep fryers and we have five or six registers, that does not matter if we only have two employees. We have all the extra deep fryers in the world, but if we don't have people to, to work with them, the marginal product of that capital, the extra amount of product we are getting for the donut shop for an extra deep fryer, not that much, right? So we have this idea of our marginal product of labor and our marginal product of capital, which just measures the amount of product produced by whatever the last unit of capital is or the last worker who's working up in a store. All right. Then we have the idea of average product. These are going to look pretty similar. So remember, we're going to have three different things I need you to know about. Total product, 
average product, marginal product. So let's 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 look at what those graphs would look like. So here we have these marginal product graphs. It's the idea if we add one more of something, what does that necessarily mean? Well, let's just go ahead and put all three of our graphs together that we're going to talk about today because this might help us understand a little bit more what they necessarily mean. So let's say that we have total product that we want to look at. And let's say in this one, we're going to look at the, let's start with labor. So let's have the marginal product of labor. And then here, let's say that we're interested in how much our employees are producing on average. So let's have the average product of labor. Yeah. Oops. All right, so product ah, of labor. My handwriting is terrible, but don't worry, these graphs are in your slides so that you do not have to be reliant on my terrible drawing abilities. I am an economist, not an artist, and that one's pretty obvious. All right, so let's say total product. So let's think about the amount of total product that we have for each additional worker. So let's say workers. Marginal product, we're going to be looking at essentially what, what is happening with quantity for each additional worker. So remember that this is marginal product. Here we are looking at the change of Q relative to the change in L. And then we're going to have the average product of labor. So this is going to be the amount of product that's being produced on average for the number of workers. The average product of labor, that's just essentially Q divided by L, whatever our total product is divided by the number of workers that we have. All right, let's go ahead and think about each of these situations. So let's say we can have one, two, three, four, or five workers in each situation. One, two, three, four, or five. One, two, three, four, or five. All right, so let's say for the first worker, for the very first worker in our donut shop, uh, we can now produce 30 donuts. Cool, wonderful, we love that. Okay, so if we've gone from zero donuts to 30 donuts in our total product, what does that mean for our marginal product? Well, that means for our first worker, going from zero workers to, to one worker means that we had an increase in 30 donuts. Okay, well, if we have 30 donuts, so that's, that's our Q divided by our number of workers, which is our L in this one, that's 30 divided by one, all righty, well, 30 divided by one, that's just 30. So we have very easy first curves, right? It's always easy when we talk about the first worker. Now let's say we have the second worker, right? So the second workers come in and you know what? They're being more productive. They're getting stuff done. They're having a great day because they are, they are in a vibe. Some people are working in the front. Some people are working in the back. All the customers are happy. Let's say that we produce 70 donuts when we have two workers. So when we have two workers, we're producing a total product of 70, okay? Well, what does that mean? What are we learning here? So um, if we have two workers, uh, the, we had 30 donuts with the first worker. Now we have the second worker. They've added in some amount. What is 70 divided by the 30 that we would have without that second worker? That's 40, right? Or minus, minus the, the 30 that we would have. So that means that the second worker brought in an additional 40 donuts to the amount that we were able to produce. Um, average is that Q divided by L. So let's think that that's 70. So we're producing 70 divided by two workers. That means that our average product, let's see right here, is going to be 35. Woo. All right, third worker, third worker comes in. And let's say, mm, great, we're real happy. Uh, we, we were doing so well with our donut shop, we decided to hire somebody else. And when that third worker came in, we started producing 90 donuts. Right, because you know, uh, at the end of the day, we still have the same number of fryers and the same number of registers. So, like that third worker, he helps. We are producing more, but like not as much more because we are still limited by the amount of capital. Well, if we have 90 donuts in our total product, then that means the marginal product, the difference in between what we would have at two workers and what we have at three workers, is going from 70 to 90. We are adding in 20 additional donuts, right? So let's say this is 20 donuts, woo. All right, for our average product of labor, which is going to be that Q divided by L, we know that we have 90 donuts divided by three workers. We are right back down to having 30, 
for our average product of labor. Notice that as total product is going up, our marginal product of labor and our average product of labor, they are decreasing, they are going down because each additional worker is not helping as much. All right, fourth worker, let's go on through. So let's say we have a fourth worker and with this fourth worker, we get to, let's say a hundred, right? We get up to a hundred uh, because like, when things, things are starting to get a tad crowded here, uh, we, we really don't have more hands on deck. Like it's nice we have an extra person to roll dough, but we really don't need them all that much. All right, so maybe we're producing 10, oops, 10 extra donuts in that case. Um, we had 90 with three workers. We now have 100 with 400 workers. The marginal product is 10. Let's think about the average product. If we are producing 100 donuts, we have four workers. And that means that our average product has fallen to 25. We are producing about 25 donuts a person. So on and so forth. If we add in another one, let's say we go to 105 donuts right here. Uh, maybe we might have an additional five donuts that are being uh, produced when we when we add one more worker. And then our average product is just what 100, 105 divided by five. So 21, 21, we also see that average product continues to fall. So what we have here, this, this area, this is our total product. This is what we're producing. Out here, if one of these, we can't necessarily, um, provide this amount. Anything underneath this curve for total product, this is attainable. With that amount of workers, we can produce that amount. Uh, at three workers, we can produce 90, but we can also produce 70 donuts. We can also produce 40 donuts. We cannot, with three workers, produce 110 donuts, right? We also see with the marginal product of labor that we see that this starts to downward slope. There is a point where adding in more workers, we are making more total product, but we are not getting as much benefit from each additional worker. We also see with the average product of labor that it starts to go up, and this goes up when the marginal product of labor is going up, when each additional person we're adding is very, very productive. But the average product of labor starts to go down when the marginal product that people are producing, the extra amount we get for each worker is below what that average amount is, it continues to fall. These are the three things we need to know. So we have total product, TP, this is just equal to Q, right? We have marginal product of labor, which this is just going to be the change in the quant or the quantity being produced. So a change in the total product relative to a change in labor. If we add in one laborer holding capital fixed, what does that mean for the amount we're producing? And then we have our average um, product of labor. So I just call this AP and then we have a little L because this is for the labor side. Well, if we divide that, this is gonna be the total amount that we are producing divided by the total number of people we have working. Total product, marginal product, average product. Woo, we got this, we got this. We are chugging along, we are doing all right. So when we start talking about this average product, this has a lot of things we have to think about when it comes to measuring the output of the average worker because sometimes it's really difficult to understand, well, adding in that second worker was really, really productive but this third worker was really, really productive. But knowing that marginal product is important but knowing how much they're producing on average is also an important key element when we start taking these different pieces, the total product, the marginal product and average product and we start adjusting it then looking at costs to figure out when things are, are are really worthwhile to produce or what good we should we should invest in or what amount of capital versus labor that we need to maximize the amount that we can produce. So let's say again that we just have our normal Cobb Douglas production function. Notice that we have K to the 0.5 and L to the 0.5. I might occasionally change what the alphas are, but for the most part we're going to be using this because square roots are easy and it's very nice for examples. If our inputs are, for example, capital at 16, because we had our fixed amount of capital in the short run, and L of 16, then the average product of labor is going to be whatever that Q function spits out divided by the number in L. So let's actually, we'll just work through this one. Let's say that we're back up here. We're thinking about this marginal or no, we'll just, we'll just start down here and write it down this way. So let's say that we're wanting to, to really focus on this average product of labor piece. Oh, picked up the wrong pin. <laughs> average product of labor piece. Okay, well, first we need to know what is this Q? So we know that Q is equal to K to the alpha, L to the one minus alpha. If we think that alpha is 0.5, we know that this Q is equal to the amount of capital that we have. We know that that was 16 to the one half times, 
And in this one, we said that we had 16 laborers, uh, 16 times the one half. So that just equals out being four times four or Q equals 16. All right, that means that we have the first half of our equation, right? Our APL is equal to 16 divided by L. Well, we know what L is. We saw it right here when we, when we were plugging it in. So our APL in this case is just 16 divided by 16 or is equal to one. At this point for that equation, it would be the case that the, or we had 16 um, additional, 16 total product divided by 16 units of labor. It can be hours, it can be people. Oh, that's a little hard to say different types of like labor and quantity over and over and over. All right, so when we start talking about this average product or capital, we have to think about measuring the output of the average unit of capital. So much like I had shown you earlier, I'm just going to show you those three graphs again because there's a really interesting way to be able to think about it, right? Um, and that's how we can put together this total product curve and uh, the marginal product curve. So remember everything inside the total product curve underneath this curve, these are things that we can produce. Now, maximizing all of our resources, if we are using our resources efficiently, we will be on this blue line because we'll be using everything we have. If we're inside, if we're in this yellow area called the attainable zone, these are bundles that we can produce, but it's not maximizing all of our resources. So for three laborers, we can produce five, what is the sweaters, um, but, but to really maximize the amount that we are producing with three workers, maybe we should produce 12. Everything outside of that is unattainable. Now notice, with um, the, the marginal product that we had something very special and unique that we were thinking about and is how much does the total product differ as we are adding in each additional worker? Something kind of like this. Actually, let me show you on the graphs that we already have. So if we have this total product, notice that, oh, this is, you know, this is too messy. Let's just redraw this out with this connection in between total and marginal product. Let's say that, we have our total product curve. Where we have Q and some number of workers. And it, it looks kind of like this. We increase the total amount of product. Now, as we're going in between them, we can start to figure out exactly how much our marginal product should be. So with the first worker, we produce this much. Well, then this square, this is sort of the marginal product of that first worker. Let's think about the second worker. If with the second worker, we produce this much. Please stop, Pen. We get another square like this. This is the marginal product of the second worker, the additional amount that they are now, now producing above what we would have had with the first worker. With the third worker, notice that, ah, hold on. We have more marginal product here, but notice that this block is smaller. When we um, push down those blocks, we push them down to the bottom, we notice that we get something like this, the marginal product of the first worker, the marginal product of the second worker, the marginal product of the third worker, fourth worker, fifth worker onwards. Notice that this is like the curve that I showed you earlier. The marginal product curve just shifts upwards and then back down relative to the gradient in which the total product is increasing or decreasing, right? So the marginal product can just be kind of thought of as what the additional amount of the total product is for each person that we're producing. And then we start to get something like this, our marginal product of labor curve, where if we're thinking about the amount of additional product that is being produced by a unit of labor, we can start to think like, ah, okay, well, at first it starts to increase and then it rapidly decreases. Much like the marginal product of labor, we also have the average product of labor, which is just taking Q and dividing it by L. When we start to put those two together on the same graph, if you really wanted to, because you could put those two lines on the same graph, we see that our marginal product, again, increases and then rapidly decreases because each additional worker, if you're holding capital fixed, may not help you all that much. If you have one deep fryer, the sixth worker doesn't help you. But average product, when we start to divide the amount that's being produced by the amount of people that are there, well, that one, again, still increases and it decreases more slowly or at a, a lighter gradient. 
Um, remember in our example that our fifth worker only added in a marginal product of five. It only produced five additional donuts. But when we were thinking about the average product, taking that 105 divided by the five workers, that was 21. It, it uh, decreases at a relative pace, right? So average product and marginal product will end up crossing one another. And I just think that that's kind of cool. It's super neat because it gives us an idea of where are we the most productive? Where are we sort of like maximizing the use of our inputs? All right, so now we need to think about how to guide the production process, especially when we're thinking about what is the amount that we want to produce. So producing on the production function, having it so it's on that line instead of inside the attainable zone, on the line itself, well, this means that we are using the max amount of effort. We are using all the additional amount that we can get from that worker. We are using all the additional amount that we can get from, from the capital that, that we have, even if it's fixed, to be able to produce as much as possible. Inside the attainable zone, we are not maximizing everything to the best of its ability. Now, the next couple parts are a little difficult. Do I wanna go into them yet? I think we're going to stop right here because this is where we're going to start thinking about when we need to consider no longer producing right when even if I add in one more worker and they increase my my total product. When is it no longer going to make sense to hire additional workers well that's going to depend on their wage right so if the value or the additional amount of product that we get from that one worker sells for about exactly as much as their wages, then hiring another worker after that may not be profitable because the additional marginal product that we have from this worker may not be enough to cover or compensate what that wage is. Likewise, for the essential wage of capital, the rent, the idea of if I was not using these machines or these non-human input devices, what, what could they return in the market? If I were to, to lend my deep fryer to a donut shop down the road, or I was to lend my oven to Sager Grounds Coffee up the road, how much could they get for, for that use? We call that rent. So when is the marginal product of an additional oven or, or a marginal product of an additional espresso machine equal to the amount of rent that it could get otherwise? So that's where we're going to start the conversation in the next video and I'll see you there.